Good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday, the 3rd of May. Good morning. Um, yeah. If you're worshiping with us and not familiar with who we are, my name is Diane Luddington. I'm the pastor at Church by the River in Keokuk and uh, Warsaw First United Presbyterian Church here in Warsaw, Illinois. This is Bill Cassidy, our singing extraordinaire, singer extraordinaire, and Lynn Johnson over here on the keyboard. Wave, come over and wave. Lynn Johnson is playing, playing keyboard for us. So we are happy to be able to gather to worship and invite you into this space. I invite you, if you are watching, to just drop a comment or a note saying who's watching because I see that we have quite a lot of views, but I don't know who it is. So I would love to hear from you. Um, we did. We're wearing our masks to model good, um, you know, good behavior, I guess. But thank, it's thank kind of difficult to do so and speak. So we will keep our distance and spread our germs outward, not toward one another. If you are needing a mask, let us know. We are. We have a group of. People who are gathered um, to make masks, and when we do gather back in our space again, we hope to have enough masks for everyone to um, have a reusable and washable mask to take with them. But if you need one, in the meantime, drop a little comment or um, an email to me, and we'll make sure that we get you one. We have all kinds of styles and fabrics and fits, so we can take care of that need. Just let us know. Put this uh, we are celebrating communion today. If you don't have your communion elements, please take a moment to prepare your communion elements. And it can be whatever your common bread and drink are. Whatever, whatever you normally have at your meal is appropriate to have for communion elements. And we'll be doing that later in the service, so I invite you to get those things prepared now. Uh, we are reaching out to other people who have not um, been with us in a while. I want to get a shout out to Sandra Fornell, who sent a note saying she appreciated being able to see her hometown church online. I haven't met you, Sandra, but hello. It's nice to, nice to know that you're there. Um, also, I, as a fairly new person in this community, I am still learning names and putting names and faces together. And I would love to have pictures. I have received two so far. One for each week that I have made the plea. I'm hoping we can get a little better track record going than that. So please email me or text me a picture of um, you and your family or just you so that I can put those things together and I'm gonna put them in my in my uh, contact file. So that You're I not can... gonna post it online, right? Well, no, but I would, it's if somebody, it's just for me right now. But if you don't want me to share your picture eventually, Make sure you let me know that because it kind of would be nice if we have new people joining us to be able to have a picture directory of sorts, not a big fancy one. We're not big fancy people, but um, it would be nice to have that. But if you don't want your sh share at all, let me know that. Um, I also want to remind you to email me any of your prayer requests and uh, we will include those in our weekly announcement um, email and also in, the, in our time of prayer today. When we, when we pray each week. I want to remind you that uh, you, we still do, the church still does have its bills to pay, so you can still continue to make your gifts and tithes through the donation link that is attached to your worship materials and the website. I think it's, you can get to it from the Facebook page. There's a lot of ways to, to access that. If you have trouble with that, let me know. Um, or you can send things in to through the mail. We are at PO Box 24 in Warsaw. I want to also thank you guys for reaching out to one another with calls and cards. I'm getting, when I call people, they're like, oh yeah, we're talking to so and so and so and so. So it's, um, it's wonderful to know that the church family is taking care of, of one another. And I, that warms my heart. But I also want to extend the invitation um, that I'm available for pastoral care visits. We we can wear masks, we can sit far apart, we don't have to violate the social distancing um, recommendations to be able to care for one another. So let your needs be known. And with all of those long announcements, we have a birthday this week. Gunnar Payne has a
her birthday on May 7th, so let's sing happy birthday to Gunnar. to note, uh, Travis and Krista McAllister celebrate their anniversary on May 7th, and Gabe and Kathy Nagy celebrate an anniversary on May the 8th. So happy anniversary to you guys as well. All right, let us begin our worship. We remember today that our salvation comes from God and God alone. Let us refresh our hearts for worship as together we remember the poetry of the 23rd Psalm. Let us say this together. The, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And now we will open with another musical refrain from Bill. Morning has broken. If you're following along, it's in the blue hymnal number 469. abundant life. God's goodness and mercy do follow us all the days of our life. And so trusting in these sure promises, we boldly confess our sin to God and with one another. Join me in the prayer of confession. Lord, Lord you are our shepherd. shepherd. You, you seek us when we are lost and guide us in life-giving ways. Yet we turn from you 
and heed the voices of thieves and bandits. You know us by name, but we refuse to hear your call, and instead go our own way. Forgive us for failing to follow you. Quiet the noise around and within us, so that we might better recognize your word and do your will. Come close, calm our fears, go ahead of us, so that we might see you clearly, enter by the gate, and be saved. And my brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Even though we walk through the darkest valley, we do not need to fear evil. God is with us. God's rod and staff comfort us. God forgives and transforms us. Friends, believe the good news. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In, In Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And as a people who are confident in that forgiveness and confident in the peace that Christ offers to us, let us share the peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from John. John 10, 1 through 10. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter in the sheepfold by the gate that climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but will run from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to st steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Love that. Have life and have it abundantly. Our second reading comes from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. The story of the early church. And we'll, we'll be reading from Acts 2, 42-47, just to set it up a little bit. This is, this is as the church is forming after the um, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. 
And Peter has just given his first sermon in which he retells all of the arguments for Jesus as the Messiah, speaking from a very Jewish point of view. They are still, they are still a Jewish group of people. They are still worshiping in the ways that they had. They're, they're kind of forming this new movement. And so the people, after his incredible um, elocution about Jesus, the one that was crucified actually was the one we were waiting for, the one that was sent, the people ask him, well, what do we do? What should we do now? Do we ask that often? <laughs> Mm -hmm. We ask that a lot. And Peter tells them, repent and be, be baptized so that your sins will be forgiven. And the text tells us that many joined the movement on that day. I think 3,000 on that day. Wow. Yeah. And so we pick up in the, in the text in verse 42. And this is the writer of Acts describing the character and the practice of the early church. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because of many wonders and signs that were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This is the church. This is a description of the first church. You know, throughout the years, the many years from that time to this, we have viewed this picture of the church as the paradigm, as the template, the, the, the church to which we should aspire as God's people. You know, these four attributes are, are just elegant. They're simple, they are the essence of life as believers, being devoted to the teaching of the apostles, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to the prayers. If we could just master those four habits, those, those four things, just imagine what could happen. Well, it tells us, you know, I mean, in the, in the verses right before where we started, there were 3,000 added in one day after Peter's preaching. And then in our, in our text, it ends with, And day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Imagine, every day, somebody being added to the number. You know, what congregation would love to have, to have that? But you know, before we get too caught up in this uh, book of numbers, as you will, Let's remember the context. We can't just take this template and overlay it on our circumstances. Times were different. The needs were different. Now, this was a fledgling movement. It was very countercultural. You may remember just a few weeks ago we talked about Jesus healing the man born blind and how his parents were afraid to say, yes, it was Jesus that healed him because any who believed, any who followed Jesus were being kicked out of the temple. And that wasn't just you can't come to church. That was being kicked out of your whole community. That was your entire life. Your entire social structure being pulled out from under you. So yes, these believers who came together had to pool all of their resources. They had to be all in with all of their earthly resources. that we're called to be in that way that all in but we are called to be all in our times are different and yes there is still need but the opportunities for meeting those needs is are different 
Now, I know if we had a few uber wealthy donors who sold everything and gave it to the church, that we could add numbers, we could add members, as long as those funds, you know, held out. We could just keep paying for everybody's bills and yeah, we'd get lots of members. But that would be getting things backwards. The numerical growth and the giving, the sacrificial giving described in this text, those were effects of the body of the church, not the cause for the body being healthy. You know, God effected the growth and the habits of the believers. That's what nurtured the young church. And so to be faithful to this text, we have to look at how it applies in our place and in our time. And I believe that those four habits that nurtured the lives and the faith of the believers then are the same four habits that can keep us together these many centuries later. The same four habits that can nurture our church today in this place. Let's look at those four habits. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and learning. I think you can't have teaching if you don't have learning. To be devoted to something is to expend some effort to it. It's not just passive. It's actually working at it. I uh, listened to a, a book recently by Peter Enns called How the, Back, How the Bible Actually Works. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting book. And the premise, Peter Enns is a, is a uh, well-respected um, Bible professor and, and um, theologian and writer, and his premise is that the books of the Bible are wisdom books. They're all full of God's wisdom, and it's not just laid out on a plate for us. We have to work at it. We can't just pull one, one hunk out and reread the words as if just those words by themselves without any context will make perfect sense. Sometimes they do, but oftentimes they don't. We have to work at what was this text? What did this, what did this wisdom that was given to these people, what did it mean in their time? What does it mean in our time? What is the equivalent now of what the wisdom that they received was? How do we actually put this into practice in our lives so that we can be faithful to the text and the God who gave it. Now that can be really hard to do sometimes because the words on the page might make sense to us because they're translated into English. And I find when I, when I see a text and it gives me pause and it makes me really wonder how does this apply, I find it really helpful to look at the text through the lens of the greatest command. You remember when Jesus was asked, Lord, what is the greatest command? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor. Then he said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. If anything that we read, we think applies in a way that is not honoring the creative God that we serve, that is not loving our neighbor that is not forgiving and redeeming in nature, then it, we can't be interpreting it right. Because on these two things, loving God and loving neighbor, everything else depends. Everything else comes from those two, those two commands, those twin commands, as Jesus calls them. And so we have to read the stories. We have to look at the teaching behind the stories of our faith. We have to look for, how does this wisdom help me love God with all of myself? And how does it help me reach out to my neighbor? And how does it affirm that God loves me and so I love myself as my neighbor? Everything has to point back to that. 
And so we can be devoted to the teaching of the apostles, which is the teaching of Christ. Our context is different, but the lesson of Christ was and still is that God is good and that you are a beloved child of God and that your creator is integral, integral to holding all of this together. You are a part of God's community, and without you, the community is less. That is the message of Christ. When he came to redeem us, it was because each of us is so irreplaceable. Each of us is so important that God went to the depths of hell to re retrieve our souls. And this church in Acts was devoted to teaching and to learning that tr truth from those who had been with Christ incarnate. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship. What does that mean? Is it the quarter quarterly potluck, maybe? Perhaps, but it's so much more than that. You know, every church thinks of itself as a friendly church. Visitors, you know, you poll visitors, they would have different opinions, but I think a church that is devoted to fellowship isn't just friendly as in a nice warm smile, maybe a, a handshake, although we're not really doing that anymore these days. A church devoted to fellowship is one that is intentional about making sure that every soul who enters that door is cared for. Not only when they're inside the doors of the church, but when they leave as well. A church devoted to fellowship reaches out to the quiet one in the back, reaches out to that odd one sitting down in the front. You know, it takes courage. It takes courage to invite someone to church. It takes courage to invite someone new to join your, your lunch group after church. It takes courage to risk getting to know a stranger. It takes courage to decide in advance that you are going to love your brother or sister, even if you don't like them all that much. You're going to care about them. It takes courage to make that declaration before the truth is evident in your life. But that's what fellowship is. Fellowship is deciding that we're going to do life together. As is described in the text and throughout the rest of the book of Acts, the believers had everything in common. They were all in the same boat, as we might say. They were doing life together. They were facing crises and joys as one body. We say that we say that these days we're in this together and we say you know we're apart but we're not alone and I love that sentiment what I love even more is that we see ways in which that is evident we see people going and getting groceries for one another we see ladies in the church basement making masks to keep one another safe we see people, strangers, dropping off things for our blessing box. We see prayers going out for one another in crisis. We see cards coming in the mail. We have phone calls together. We are in this together, and that is fellowship. Being devoted to fellowship is being intentional about making sure no one gets left behind. The believers devoted themselves to breaking of bread. Now this isn't the same as eating together. Let's look at the text. It says, day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. They were in the temple, but they went home to break bread. Breaking bread, as, as we know it now too, is a word for the, what we say when we when we take the sacrament we're breaking bread together when we take communion together 
Now, the, the early church was comprised of Jewish believers. They were in the temple. But they couldn't celebrate that together in the temple. They had to go home for that. They were devoted to making sure that they followed Christ's command to do this in remembrance of him. To come together as the body of Christ, to remember the sacrifice that Christ made. They were devoted to remembering that the Messiah's body was broken and blood was spilled to effect redemption, to win the way over death for all believers. They were devoted to making sure they remembered that lesson. And they devoted themselves to the prayers. It doesn't say to prayer, to the prayers. One mark of an authentic congregation is involvement in prayer. Now we know that the early church made a habit of memorized prayer and reciting the Psalms. They prayed together these unifying statements. Probably the most famous that we still use is the Lord's Prayer. But also in just a, a couple hundred years, a few hundred years, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and many creeds after that were established so that believers could together learn those things and hold in unity what they believed and remember those things. Now, it's not the mark of a true Christian to say the right prayers, to memorize and to recite the correct words in sequence. It's not about that. It's about having a common voice it's about knowing that you're not the only one who believes this. You're not the only one. And you can learn lessons from those who have gone before you. It's to have a common voice. To be comforted by familiar words when you really don't have the words for yourself. I remember one time I was visiting a woman in a nursing home. And she didn't have all of her faculties. She couldn't, she couldn't really converse with me. She couldn't remember where she was. But when I started reading to her Psalm 23, which we recited together this morning, she started mouthing the words. Tears rolled down her face as those familiar words, the prayers to which she had been devoted, found their place in her heart and came out again. I'm never, I, I, I'm always amazed, I never tire of our familiar words that we share in the Apostles' Creed and in the Lord's Prayer and in Psalm 23. Those things that we share together where we know the words and we can say them without thinking and it's a little bit deeper it's a little bit deeper than if we were thinking it in the front of our minds. I love those prayers. They're not rote. They're by heart. That's being devoted to the prayers, is to have them in your heart. Now, there are many ways to pray. Some prayers are your own. They're not anyone else's. And those are important. Prayer is taking the time to be in God's presence. Sometimes we do that together. Sometimes we do that alone. But to be devoted to prayer is to make sure that there is, there is space in your life for God's presence. Because we can shut him out if we want. To be devoted to prayer is to make a decision that you're not going to shut God out. Now let's make sure that we, as the church, don't get things backward. You know, we want to have a vibrant and thriving church again. We do have a vibrant and thriving church. Our numbers are smaller. But we are devoted 
We're devoted to learning the Word of God. We are devoted to being one another's life partners. We are devoted to worshiping together. We are devoted to praying together. Numerical growth is not really our goal. God will bring the growth that serves the kingdom. But the part that we play in being the Acts 2 church, the privilege that we have, is to nurture those habits of Jesus followers throughout the ages, to be devoted to the teachings, the fellowship, the worship, and to remembering the prayers. That is what makes us a vital congregation. That is what makes us together the bride of Christ. Amen. Join me now in, in our affirmation of faith. Let us confess the faith of confidence in our Lord and pledge ourselves to the call of God. The Lord, the Lord my God, God is one. I shall I love the Lord my God, God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind, and with all my strength. And I shall love my neighbor as myself. In this is the fullness of the word of God. For God has called me not according to my own goodness, but according to the divine purpose. And now Bill will sing for us, and Lynn will play for us, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. It's the rendition of the beautiful psalm that we just recited. It's the um, in the red hymnal number 66, if you're following along.
prayers of joy and concern, and we stay at the table to receive the sacrament of communion. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Let us pray to the triune God who is the source of all life. Lord, you are the bread of life. God, we give you thanks. You create all things good, and you nourish your creation with tender gifts. We thank you for all the ways that you breathe life into our lives. We hear your words, O bread of life, and yet we are hungry. We are hungry for peace, for an end to the violence in our neighborhoods and in our world. For people who hear gunshots in the night and bombings in the day, we are hungry for peace, O oh God. We are hungry for justice, for an end to the oppression in our nation and in our world, for people who suffer because of racism, sexism, poverty, and the fear of the other. We are hungry for justice, O oh God. We hear your words, O oh cup of blessing, and yet we are thirsty. We are thirsty for righteousness. We are thirsty to know your truth. We are thirsty to feel your presence. We are thirsty for your spirit to, to quench our parched souls. We are thirsty for righteousness, O oh God. We pray for those in our community who thirst this day. We pray especially this morning for Simon as he heads to receive chemo treatment on Monday. We pray for Vicki as she heads to Mayo Clinic on Wednesday. We pray for all of those in our midst who are afraid for what this virus means to them, both in their health and in their well-being and in their finances. We pray for all of those who are waiting, who are waiting, who are waiting for this break in our lives to begin to heal. Lord, you are the bread of life, and you nourish and sustain our souls. We give thanks for who you are, and we offer our whole selves to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We come to the time of communion. It's a little bit of a strange time, because we can't all gather physically around this table. But in the mystery of our faith, we know that we are one together. All who profess, all who seek, all who receive the body and the blood of Christ. Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters by me will be saved. Others have come to serve themselves, but Jesus came. He said, I have come that my sheep may have life and have it abundantly. And so come, let us enter into this time of communion with great joy. The table of bread and wine is now to be made ready. It is the table of company with Jesus and with all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world whom Jesus, with whom Jesus identifies. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ became incarnate. So come to the table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. Come to the table, you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a very long time. Come to the table, you who have tried to follow Jesus and all of us who have failed. Come to the table of redemption. We enter into the great thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a 
joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, living God. Time after time you draw us to this kneel, to inspire us. You feed us, and you save us. Especially when our love fails, you are here, steadfast and true. You created this world, and you called it good. You created us to proclaim your goodwill to all. As, As your, your people, people, we, we praise, praise your name and, and offer, offer ourselves to your service. service. Listen now for the story of our faith. Our Creator fashioned us in the divine image and called us to be a holy people. But we turned away, leaving sin and death to reign. Still, God loved us and sought after us. In Christ, God defeated death and opened the way to eternal life. In Jesus, born of Mary, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners. It proclaimed the good news of God's kingdom to the poor and the needy. And dying on the cross, Jesus gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. And now, seated at the right hand of God the Father, Christ leads us to eternal life. We praise you, God, that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to renew all creation. Gracious God, pour out your spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and wine. Pour yourself out so that the bread that we break and the cup that we bless may become for us the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your spirit, Lord, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name. Make us one in ministry in every place and every time. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ to the world. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood for the remission of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. And so embracing the mystery of the Spirit, we take these gifts from our Creator, and we rejoice in the redemption won for us by Jesus Christ. Every time that you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This table, your table, whatever table you are celebrating at today, is not a Presbyterian table. This is the table, this is the offering of Jesus Christ, and all who seek to know him are welcome to this meal. By God's grace, these simple gifts, the common bread and drink of your home, represent the presence and the sacrifice of God. Wherever you are, that which is before you represents the gift that God offered to you for the people of God. And so I invite you now to take a generous portion of the bread. And with those in your, in your home, those in your surroundings, take the bread. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you.
Take the cup. Hold it high. Know that this is the cup of salvation. This is the cup of redemption. This is the cup that wins your soul. This is God's grace poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Most gracious God, accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. You have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. May we who drink his cup bring life to others. And we whom the Spirit enlightens give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth shall live to praise your name. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, as he taught us saying together, Our Father, Our Father who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this, this day our daily bread, and forgive us, us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll come to the time where we all go back to God, a portion of those things that we have been given. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for forgiveness. We might live for righteousness. We might be in a right relationship with God. By his wounds, you and I have been healed. For you and I, we were going astray like sheep. And now we have returned to the shepherd. We have responded to the guardian of our souls. How then will we respond to such a gift? We respond with gratitude and by giving joyfully a portion of what God has entrusted to us. Let us worship God with God's tithes and our offerings. You walk with us through the darkest valleys. You provide for us in the direst of circumstances. You lead us beside still waters and you restore our souls. In joy and gratitude, we offer you these gifts. Bless them and use them, we pray, to show others the gate of salvation and the abundant life made possible through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And my brothers and sisters, you have heard the call of the shepherd. Listen for the leading of the one who saves your spirit from anxiety and despair. Respond to the voice of the one who saves your soul for eternity. As you go into the world, with your social distancing, with your safety measures in mind, don't let anxiety and fear overwhelm you. Remember the one who saves you. And so go letting the love of God sustain you, the life of Christ embolden you, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep us together until we meet again.
Ready to go. Thanks. Thanks again for the mask. You're welcome.